What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artists of Data Science Open Office Hours. It is Friday, October 16th, 2020. Super excited that you guys are all here to join in on the office hours. I hope you've had an amazing week. Uh, it's been a busy week here on the podcast. Released a couple of really awesome episodes on Monday. We released an episode that I really, really enjoyed and really had the pleasure of um, of coming up with the questions and, and chatting with him was Dr. Andrew Gelman. He is um, pretty much a legend in statistics. He is a professor at Columbia University, and he runs the Department of Statistics there. Um, he's written a lot of wonderful um, articles and pieces on statistics as well. So hopefully you guys got a chance to check that out. Very controversial title to that episode. Decided to title the episode after a um, after a quote I heard him say, which was, statistics is the least important part of data science. So definitely go check out that episode to learn more about why that's so and on Thursday, we released an episode with Dr. Anderson Pruitt. He is the CEO of Pruitt Solutions. Um, that conversation was really cool. It took a completely different turn than what I thought it was going to be. We went completely off script with them, the questions I prepared, but I really enjoyed that conversation. So I hope you guys get a chance to check that out as well. Earlier this week on Monday, I was on Max Zhang's Human Prosperity podcast, so definitely check that episode out. It is going to be shared in the show notes, so you'll be able to check that out. Um, this week, I interviewed some pretty cool people, interviewed Fred Pellard on Sunday. He wrote the book, How to Be St Strategic. Really excited to, um, to, to release that episode. Also spoke with Justin Wynn. He is the host of the Declassified College podcast. Uh, that was a really cool episode. I really enjoyed it. His podcast is awesome. You guys check that out. I'll be sure to link that in the show notes as well. And we also had um, an interview with Dennis Rothman. So it was a really, really productive week here. All right. So we've got nobody in the office hours. So we're just gonna chill out, I guess, and wait for people to join in. All right. All right, we got somebody joining in here. Hey, how is it going? Uh, man, I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing your name, but it, is it Udunayo? So Udunayo, how's it going? Is that how you say your name? Yeah, Udunayo. That's how I say my name. All right, on, man. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. How about you? I'm good, man. Just hanging out. I was just uh, recapping the week, talking about all the uh, cool things we did here at the Artists of Data Science, um, waiting for people to come into the office hours, and you're the first one, so definitely join in, man. How you doing? Yeah, that's that's great. Like I'm, uh, this is my this is the first time I'm joining this show, so I'm really looking forward to learning. And yeah, yeah, definitely, man. So it's just pretty much an open office hour, so it's an opportunity for you to ask any questions that you have, whether it is a, a question related to data science, breaking into data science, how to become a data scientist, uh, if you need a resume review, just any questions you got, man, I'm happy to help with. Yeah, sure, sure. I definitely have a question. Uh, I'm a recent graduate and I'm trying to break in uh, into uh, like getting a role as a data scientist, right? Okay. And I've been like uh, doing a lot of uh, tutorials uh, 
But right now, I've been trying to switch and creating, how to develop a project, uh, a personal project that I, I can showcase. So from that point, like, since I don't have like a lot of experience, how will I put that on my resume? That is, yeah. Yeah, so you would just have a place on your resume, a, you know, just, just like how you'd have experience, have another section titled um, projects, data mm-hmm. science projects, and you can just have it live there under that uh, heading. And you would describe the project, you know, pretty much how you describe your other work experience, hopefully using the star format, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so situation, task, action, results. So you want to, to, to make it easy on yourself, think yourself, think your way through this, this sentence, right? For this project, the situation was to do dot, dot, dot. Mm-hmm. My task was to do dot, dot, dot. The action I took or the analysis I performed was dot, dot, dot. And as a result, my conclusion was dot 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 right Mm -hmm. so that's how you want to describe your project on your resume did i answer your question or did i answer like a completely different question yeah yeah you did you did it's it's, it was a great answer yeah yeah so i would would make sure like you know the project that you have on your github it's not really a good practice just to have a notebook up there and just have it be like project.ipynb Right. Okay. So make sure that whatever project you have put up on GitHub mm-hmm. to be viewed as part of your portfolio, that that project follows a a real clear repository structure. Something mm-hmm. that I use is called cookie cutter data science. So I use the cookie cutter repository structure. Okay. Um, the reason you want to do that is you want to just look professional, right? So if you're going to do a project, mm-hmm. the whole purpose of doing a project is to try to best emulate work experience as possible, right? So you're trying to do the same things that you would do on yeah. a professional data science team. So having that clear repository structure, have all of your functions nicely written out, placed in a helper file, call those into your notebook, you know, keep everything nice and clean, make sure your code is well documented, mm-hmm. well commented. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're doing your... Um, exceptions if you need to do those um so yeah mm-hmm. okay cool no, man that sounds good thank you yeah <laughs> yeah definitely Thanks, right on we got jaya in the house and we got owen how you guys doing welcome Hi. to office hours super happy to have you here how you been not too bad good very good awesome awesome glad to hear it um if you got a question man go for it I have a question. Um, like in the data science field, right? That is the technical track and the leadership track. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the leadership track, what it takes to be in the leadership track and uh, you know some of the requirements and some of the best practices that you've seen. Uh, if you can share a little bit about the leadership track, if you, if you can. Uh, so let me try to break that question down a little bit more because it's a huge question. So. Okay. Well, let's try to get to the question behind the question, right? So you're wondering if you're on the data science leadership track, like what is different from regular day-to-day data science work? Yeah, yeah. So, what's the difference between, techni- I guess maybe let's start, what's the difference between technical and leadership track? Maybe that will get uh, started with a few more questions. I think ultimately anyone who's on the technical track should have an aspiration to become a leader in the field, right? So if you think about the leadership track, usually it's, it's not one person working on like 10 different projects. It's one leader who has maybe small groups working on projects, right? So instead of you being in the nitty gritty, getting dirty with code, you'd probably be help, helping to facilitate a project mm-hmm. along from its ideation phase with whatever stakeholder to mm-hmm. a data science problem that you can then communicate to data scientists to help them solve that, right? So that's kind of, in my view, I guess that's the biggest difference. Um, but that really, really depends on like the maturity of your team, the organization you're in, right? Mm-hmm. So 
you could be a leader data science uh, or leader in data science at your organization and be the only data scientist, which means you have to do everything. Mm -hmm. I see. So that's it's that's its own set of challenges. So there's leadership in the sense of I'm starting up a data science practice in a larger organization. Then there's leadership in terms of I'm going to inherit a pre-existing team, serve as their leader, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, but, yeah, because the reason I ask is um, I like for me, for me, um, I've got like 20 years of experience, and uh, you know, I I really don't. Want, I mean. I rather prefer to lead versus getting my hands dirty uh, in in coding and stuff. I, I do less of code. Basically, I'm saying I like to do less of coding, more of leadership. So tell me what what you envision a leadership role being like. Like what what about that do you enjoy, or what aspect of that do you find yourself being? Sure. So yeah. basically, I think what I enjoy most is like um, have a group of people. Uh, that I work with, and they are the ones who are actually coding, building models, and building algorithms and stuff like that. And uh, and as a leader, I like to make sure that those things are done. I really like. I, I mean, I, I don't want to be dealing with code. I like to have a team of data scientists, or machine learning engineers, to do that part of work. They do the technical aspect, but then. The leader is somebody who takes that and delivers to the executives, right? So uh, that's the like I guess you can say leader is like a like a middle person between the data yeah. scientist and the executive team. So I like to be playing that role more of that role versus uh, being in the technical aspects of it. But I think a leader also should know what's going on or what what the data science and machine learning engineers are doing because they should know the I mean they should be aware of the code and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, so it sounds to me very, I mean, just, just based on what you're describing, you're describing to me what sounds like a project management type of role, right? Mm -hmm. So you can definitely be a project manager on a data science team. Uh, my former organization that I was at, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a situation. There was a project manager who would be the, the kind of the middle person between the product team and our team mm -hmm. and come to us with a business request, and then we'd work on solving that. Mm -hmm. and then communicate the results to him and then he'd give it back to whatever project team it needed um consuming of that so that's kind of what it sounds like you're describing mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so if that's the case and yeah that's completely okay too and i think being a product manager understands the data science life cycle and and data science is a huge asset mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's definitely I beneficial think. um mm -hmm. so I but I guess if yeah. you're leading a team of data scientists and machine learning engineers, that will be something not project management, but more of a data science manager, something of that sort. Am I right? Yeah. So if you're talking about a full on data science like department where you have multiple um multiple projects bouncing around at once and you have multiple little teams working on stuff. Mm -hmm. then that's i would say that's more of like a data science leader because you're overseeing a much mm -hmm. bigger piece of of the puzzle rather mm -hmm. than just projects one-off projects right mm -hmm. okay okay i'm hoping that was a convincing enough yeah it is, it is. i'm just <laughs> like, trying to figure yeah, out right. um i'm uh, just trying to figure out if that is any if you require any special skills for that i I feel like you don't, but um, um, yeah, you I mean, can share. Yeah, you need to know, like, you need to to know it. You need to know the shit, right? Yeah, of course. Right, yeah. yeah. So you got to be, you got to be able to, to at least understand what it is that, you know, the business problem, what it is, so that you can then convert it to a data science problem, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they need to know Absolutely. the details of what's going to make a good solution work, what's not going to make a good solution work, and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I guess I, I mean I I see where your confusion is coming from because yeah. I, I'm starting to confuse myself by my descriptions. <laughs> but, but I would say the biggest thing is that you know a data science leader, like if you're talking about like a data science manager, mm -hmm. um, you should at least be able to step in and solve with a problem if somebody's mm -hmm. 
junior to you is stuck, right? Correct. And the really only way you're going to be able to do that is if you at least have some competency and command of whatever programming language it is that you're using. Absolutely. And definitely kind of the uses and abuses of whatever particular methodology you're using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think... Yeah, I think that I think you have a point because I think that is important. If you want to be a data science manager, you need to know what Python is. You need to know what the machine learning models are, at least at a high level. I feel so. Yeah, um, maybe even a little bit deeper than than a high level, right? Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but you you have to be able to to step in and support when those things like need supporting, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. a data science leader would be somebody who let's say something happens with one of your employees and they either they they leave the company or they're on extended leave or whatever yeah. and then you're down a member on your team right correct mm-hmm. so the data science manager should be able to be like all right cool let's let's fucking do it right let's roll up the yep. sleeve let's, let's get this done we got it we got a shit right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the project manager i don't see doing that yeah, you're right. They, they're just kind of facilitating the projects, right? So two different teams and so forth. They don't actually do the yeah. work uh, in terms of coding and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. That's, so I think, for I think that that's reason, the that's, yeah, for that reason, that's why it sounded like your mm-hmm. description was like a project manager description. Uh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like I could have been more elegant with the answer, but hopefully that was illustrative and helpful to somebody out there. Um, Owen, how you doing? Hey, man. Uh, hey. Too bad. Right on, man. Um, thanks for doing this. I have a technical question, not so much about data science as a career, but more so just a project that kind of came on my plate. Yeah, I could try, man. Sure. Um, so I'm a data analyst. Um, I'm doing some moon lane hours for a friend of mine who has a consulting business. And basically the opportunity that came on my plate was he works for, um, or one of his clients is a insurance autos company that basically takes in insurance autos and then, um, is a platform to then sell that to private and commercial. So the specific task that they wanted to share or that they put on my plate was to, create a, either a segmentation affinity model or a propensity model based solely off of purchasers of vehicles. So there are vehicle characteristics um, and then there are of course buyer characteristics. So what I would ultimately want to do is train based off of say the first nine months of auto auctions of just a single buyer on a single stock And then when a new vehicle comes in with a specific set of characteristics, I would say, okay, so these top 10, 50, 100 have the highest propensity to purchase this vehicle based off of their purchase history. Does that make sense? By any chance, do you have like a data set you can just show like the head of just like a... Sure. Um, Yeah, this would be a really basic example. Yeah, yeah, Um, definitely. I'm really way more visual than uh than auditory so no it's totally fine Uh, um and actually yeah and i had shared this with the r for data science because i am an r programmer um Mm -hmm. and i had shared this with the r for data science community and the recommendations that came my way were um more so for clustering and i can share my screen Ashton, how's it going, man? Good to see you here. How's it going, Herford? Yeah, good, man, uh, good. first one here. So I just wanted to check out what the uh, what was going on here. Yeah, so, definitely, man. Nice definitely. Here. Yeah, awesome. Dude, happy you're here. Um, so All this right. is a very basic example of a vehicle ID okay. characteristics that I was talking about are the vehicle age, mileage um, on the current vehicle, the estimated uh, value of the vehicle, um, and then you could even get more descriptive okay. in terms of the make and model cool. um so is this, it, is this sure. uh just the granularity of it like what is it is it one row per vehicle id or multiple yeah. rows per vehicle id okay so um and um and obviously over the course of nine months it is um disproportionate in terms of 
there are some buyers who buy tens of thousands and there are some buyers who only buy a few, which makes this a little bit more difficult. But then further there are, it, what makes it difficult is that like the vehicle characteristics are pretty correlated. Like the fact that if you have an older vehicle, it's likely to have more miles on it and it's likely to cost less. Mm -hmm. So my, my thought was then, you know, I would love to use, you know, logistic regression immediately came to my mind. Of, what okay, are you so trying the, to predict again? I'm trying to predict who given a new vehicle, a new vehicle that comes to auction mm -hmm. with a specific set of characteristics, who is most likely to be the purchaser or want to purchase a vehicle. Okay, so here we have vehicle data, just everything about vehicles, everything from the ID to age, mileage, estimated value, whether it was damaged or not, the make, the date it was sold, the buyer ID, and the buyer type. So which one of these is the column to be predicted? Would it be the buyer type? That's what I'm struggling with the most. I, I'm not necessarily sure. Okay. I would assume it would be the combination of all because it's based off of vehicle. Like, I guess that's where I'm really confused in terms of my immediate predictors. And so my, now is it, is the problem statement this, is it that, okay, if a random dude comes up or, or do that comes up to the auction, you want to be able to predict if that person is going to. It would be the other way around. It would be a new vehicle. So I guess what I'd be predicting is the buyer. Okay. So buyer type. Okay. Yeah, but what are the buyer ID? Um, buyer ID. Buyer, I guess. Oh, is there oh, a buyer ID? Okay, awesome. Yeah, there. Sorry. Yeah, there is, um, and there are some other variable characteristics that I just didn't add in here for a okay. minimal example. So, um, in in your data set itself, do you have multiple rows per buyer ID? Yes, you do. Okay. So, and how many buyer IDs do you have in total? Like unique ones. Fifty-five thousand. Okay, great. So you could start by first, let's, if you're trying to predict who would buy it. So I, for example, like buyer triple A can show up more than one time in the data set because he's bought a bunch of different shit, right? Yeah. All right, cool. So let's go from this. If that is a thing you want to predict, then would it make sense to then go from a data set that has multiple rows per buyer ID to one row per buyer ID and then have columns that capture that person's buying behavior, right? You can have, a, you can group by buyer ID. You can count number of vehicles they've purchased, average vehicle age, average vehicle mileage, how much, you know, what's this, on average, what does this person tend to spend on a car, right? You, mm -hmm. can, you can flag the most recurring type of vehicle this person t buys like, by getting the mode of the vehicle name column, right? Group yeah. by buyer ID, get mode of vehicle name. You can count the number of different vehicles this person like buys, the different types of makes this person buys. Right. I mean, you could probably do a feature engineering and go from vehicle make to, to um, domestic or foreign, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's actually... Possible. Yeah, that was a, a piece too that I was curious about. I had thought about that approach. Um, I was trying to think of the most pragmatic way to approach it because in this, it happened to be in this data set that there are, it was an open field. So mm -hmm. the make and model can just be a mess. And I was going to then just kind of condense my factors, of course, have a massive other option and then make it a very long, excuse me, wide data set instead of you know long and tidy and then potentially even like nest and try to form some type of model. Um, so it's reassuring to hear that you thought the same thing. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean that approach sounds reasonable to me. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's I, kind of yeah. how I would approach. And then if, if now the thing is, okay, we're trying to develop a model now to say if this car with these characteristics or put up on the auction block, which buyer ID would have the greatest probability of purchasing or bidding on the car? I guess it's not option auction or anything, right? So it's just it, yeah, it is an auction, which auction. Um, is another data set, and that's just exponentially bigger. Um, mm -hmm. However, this was just at the ground level. How could we um, kind of more of a minimal viable product of 
things that we can do. And of course, vehicle segmentation was one thought, um, some classification in some ways, which was actually another thought that I had too in a wide data set that if I were to first do either it's, you know, a KNN, K-means or some sort of classification of vehicles, and then basically count the number of vehicles in each of the classification types. And that could be an additional way of, okay, so <clears throat> based off of the overall market availability for say vehicles of Ford Focus, roughly 10 years old with 70,000 miles on it, um, how many out of the available of similar cars did a single buyer purchase? Of course, it's, that makes sense in theory in my mind, but I'm not necessarily sure how to put that into a model, but that might be a little more sophisticated than just a basic model like we were just talking about. Yeah, so it sounds to me like you're, you're saying something along the lines of, um, can you add a feature to this data set that is itself the output of a, another model? Yeah. And I think that is definitely okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I appreciate you sharing. I know this was a little different um, flavor than maybe what the office hours were initially. Nah, created this, is, for, but. this is exactly what I do five times a week. I did a science stream job. It's shit like this. That's Jaya. She's part of it. So uh, she can, she can attest to what office hours are like for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. No problem, man. Um, Ashen, man, how's it going? Well, uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, I don't have anything like any questions or anything. Um, just wanted to check out, say hi. All right on, man. Well, that's, that's all good, man. Happy to, happy to have you, dude. Yeah. Yeah, man. So have you guys, it's, it's, no, go yeah, sorry, go ahead. no, I was just gonna ask if you guys all listen to podcasts or how, how'd you, I mean, cause I know you listen yeah. to podcasts, you messaged me about that, yeah. but uh, well, I know Jay, I think does. Oh, and do you? So you yeah, all, actually, all the way I was introduced to you was I'm, um, um, I have a LinkedIn connection with Carlos and then I okay. saw that he had shared, um, his episode with you and I listened to it like almost immediately that it came out and mm -hmm. that was just a really engaging conversation. So I enjoyed listening to you guys and wanted to take you up on this, especially when I had this question. Oh yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. Yeah. I'm happy to, to do things like this. Like, um, my favorite part of data science, hands down is the feature engineering like that is like that's the thing i want to say that's like my my superpower in data science is my feet able ability to come up with some interesting features given enough information um so yeah that's, that's which explicitly kind of, can you define like by feature engineering i that to me that's more of a buzzword just because i had never done it so i'm kind of like yeah oh, this is so it. what we're talking about right like going from data that has a certain granularity right like it's extremely mm -hmm. difficult to predict i mean just like you know like the way we had that data set done right was trying to predict the buyer id but then that buyer id repeated itself multiple times in the data set right so just going from that format to a format where it's just one row per buyer ID where each okay, column yeah. and represents some type of summary. Like to me, that's what I mean by feature engineering. Like that's one part of it for sure. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's what I meant in this context there. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Right on, man. So um yeah man, if anybody has questions, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, no, no, no questions, but, uh, yeah. Hey, Owen, Hey, Jaya. Um, Thank you. yeah. So Owen, you said you, uh, you have, you know, Carlos on LinkedIn. Are you from, uh, the DMV area? No, I, um, no. you're talking about in terms of like my industry. No, no, just say like, where, like just the location, I guess. I, I just oh. assumed you were in the DMV area. Um, like, or if you need Carlos in person, Gotcha. Oh, DM, I'm thinking DMV is in VD, VD, VM. <laughs> no, Department, um, Department of Motor Vehicles. Yeah, I was a little, con yeah. yeah, I don't know, because we're talking about cars. So of course, I just kind of, my mind kind of went there. Oh, yeah. I'm originally from, uh, I'm originally from Milwaukee, and then um, wanted to move out of the snow. So my fiance and I currently live in Nashville, which is, gotcha. uh, you know, 
slightly warmer. Nice. Milwaukee's cool, man. I really like Milwaukee. When I lived in Chicago, I'd, I'd go there a few times because it's like an hour and a half north of Chicago. Yeah. Super nice city, super clean, on the lake. Have you been to Summerfest? I have, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Summerfest is such a cool concept, man. Like two weeks of pretty much free concert. Oh, yeah. 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 Especially in high school, that was the place to be. Um, kind of yeah. connect the dots. I remember I went one year and I thought I was going to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? Sure. Um, I misread the billing and it was actually Red Hot Chili Pipers. So <laughs> they were a... a a band that played covers of Red Hot Chili Pepper songs, but using bagpipes. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, that reminds me. Yeah, that reminds me. I don't know if you guys have seen, are familiar with the show Community on um Yeah, Netflix. I love that show. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So remember, like, there's an episode where they call, um, they thought they invited Green Day to play at their school, but it's the Irish band called Green Day, let's G R E N E. So like they play backpipes and all that stuff. Uh, that's hilarious. Funny. Yeah, man. So how's everybody's week going? Uh, what have you guys been up to this week? Anything? I mean, are you guys are all employed, or are you guys breaking into data science, or or what's? Yeah, uh, let me uh, let me start off actually. Um, so I got into data science. Um, since the lockdown. So like, you know, late March, um, I went to the uh, data science DSCO virtual and um, it was amazing. I mean, I didn't know anything about data science or what it was, but after the uh, conference, it was uh, pretty clear to me that that's where I want to go. So I actually recently, like two, two, three weeks ago, I started a, a new job as a junior data developer. So it's nice. pretty exciting. Uh, before that, I was just doing like um, support, uh, like IT support stuff. Um, not like kind of scattered everywhere, but like now it's like I get to work with uh, tools like Snowflake, Airflow, um, uh, DBT, and all this like you know data pipeline orchestration stuff. So that's what I'm up to right now. Nice man, that's exciting, man. Congrats, new job. Dude, that's yeah, thank you. That's awesome. It's it's a huge leap. Uh, nothing I've done before, but uh, your podcasts and all those. Uh, resources are very helpful and your stuff on LinkedIn. I mean, great. No, man, I'm glad you enjoyed it. So are you like, how far removed are you from, from school? Like was this? Oh school? yeah. Um, I graduated in college and, uh, undergrad in like, um, 2017. So. Okay. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Damn. 2017. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You guys are young, man. Yeah. <laughs> Just turned 26. So, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Who are you? How, how uh, are 30, you? 37. Oh, yeah. not that old. <laughs> could be older, man. I guess I could be older. Yeah. <laughs> Doing stuff like this keeps you young, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, got got the podcast, got, you know, full-time job. Uh, full-time job as a intrapreneur building up a data science practice from scratch at a larger organization. Mm-hmm. Like that is freaking amazing. Mm-hmm. Such a good experience. Like learn so much every day. Um, it's just tremendous, tremendous opportunity. So I've been doing that full time. And then every evening, pretty much I do office hours just like this, but at data science right. club and those office hours are a bit more busier than these. Like I'll have maybe 10, 11 students coming in. Um, and then podcast stuff, which, and then, and then on top of all that, five month old baby. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. That must keep you busy. Yeah. So with all this like changes and, you know, developments in your life, how do you have time to still do your technical stuff? Uh, the more exciting. So, I mean, you're building, you're, you're building up your podcast and newsletter coming up. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, what else do you have? Like you have a lot going on. So do you ever just sit down and just like, you know, code away? Yeah. I mean, during the day job. Um, okay. Right. So like to me, this just, it's just massive discipline and rigor and structure in terms of schedule. Right. So right. every morning I'm up you know, between four and four thirty. Yeah. Right. 
Wow. And then you know, morning routine kicks off, right? So then I'll do that, get into maybe a quick 10, 12 minute meditation while the water boils for the coffee. Then I'll have coffee come straight downstairs and I have this journaling routine. So I've got a one line journal. So it's a five-year journal and every page on the journal is uh, like this. There's multiple lines on a particular day of the year. Right. That's five spaces to write with it, with the prompt. A dot journal? Is that what it's called? Uh, this is just a five-year journal. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start off with this. I'll start writing in this journal and then I'll go to the proper journal and I'll start just, just writing whatever and then going into a idea journal. So that's like the first 45 minutes of, of my morning. And, and then after that, it's just like preparing stuff for podcasts because preparing for podcasts is so much work if you want to do a good episode, right? So I will oh, yeah. spend for any given episode, right? Especially about an author, right? That's an entire book that I read. Uh, wow. And I want to read the entire book of the author. And if it's an author that's written more than one book, like I'll go hard on, on all their books um, just to prepare for that. So like last week I interviewed Fred Pellard for how to be strategic. And it's like, his book was so amazing. Um, it just, it's just like, it's really good when it comes out, go get it guys. Um, but yeah, that was like reading an entire book and preparing for that. And earlier this month, I interviewed Christian Bush, Dr. Christian Bush. He wrote a book called The Serendipity Mindset. So yeah, I had to read that entire book. So yeah, anywhere between uh, six to 12 hours of prep time for an interview. How do you find people for your interviews? Uh, do you just know them or is it connections of your connections? Or No, dude, like this is straight, just <laughs> like invading she- people's inboxes. Like I am... <laughs> I'll, like I started off, I was like, okay, well, I got a bookshelf here with just a tremendous amount of like maybe like seventy something books here, and I've got a bunch of authors that I like. So I started reaching out to them, and some people would like say yes, and some people would say no. Right. And that's that's okay. And somehow I managed to get in touch with one person at Penguin Random House, and mm-hmm. that was uh, Dr. Camilla Pang. She wrote Explaining Humans, and in order for me to get the PDF of her book, I had to contact her uh, publicist and then once I got her publicist email address I was like hey by the way do you have anybody else that I can interview and so I just been like hitting them up consistently trying to get people off the show Um, so that's how I got in with like Penguin Random House like I just like I forced my way into their door and I got a bunch of their authors coming on the show so it's been awesome I'm sorry for taking up all the questions but one more question so like what's what's one of the things uh, what's one of the uh, incentives you give them like hey do the authors like do you tell them hey your book will get more exposure or like you tell them hey like, i have this many listeners listening to my podcast so maybe they'll you yeah. know buy your I, book i give them the opportunity to serve mankind <laughs> by speaking about the concepts that they discuss in their book and letting them know that you know, I've got access to an audience and my audience could benefit greatly from their words, their work and their perspective. Please come on the show and talk about it. Um, So that's kind of how I frame it. (laughs) Not as extreme though. I don't, yeah. (laughs) Gotcha. Yeah. Right on, man. We got Navia in the house. How are you doing? Hi, Harpreet. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good, good. Long time no see, man. Miss miss you around the data science stream job office hours. I know. I'm I miss it too. So here I am. But uh, you've got a cool new setup with the mic and everything. When yeah, you- yeah. I I went a little bit more pro. Oh, you did. <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah. I'm hanging out here, so I right let everyone else ask their questions if they have any. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But yeah, if anybody else has a question, I'm happy to, happy to answer. Yeah, is it always, um, yeah, so I'm, not, I'm, you know, the first time to the, to mm-hmm. the office hours, um, but uh, I think Owen already asked this earlier, is it geared towards um, what, like, only like data science or in technical questions or how, no, dude, how, any, how does anything, it go? Absolutely anything. Okay. Yeah, like, if, if all I do is data science, technical questions, like, that 
that would like make me not want to do this as often because right. as interesting as that is, it's like, all right, most of the questions people have, especially like even at Data Science Dream Jobs, like most of the questions that you have that I've come across can easily be answered by just a couple of Google searches. You just need to right. know how to search for the right thing. Gotcha. Um, so I don't want to be like Google or Stack Overflow for people, but right. like questions like like Owen had, like that was really awesome to, to mm -hmm. work through that or random other questions like, that's fine. But if somebody like came on and, and if all I had to do was answer questions like, oh, which algorithm should I use here? Or how should I tune this hyperparameter? Like that would, that would drive me insane. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. And I can vouch for that too, because the number of Google searches and actually it took me so long to share my screen because my other screen, I was a little embarrassed by the number of tabs that were open. Yeah. <laughs> Searching. This. But um yeah i've seen some people's like tab counts i'm like man how do you how do you focus with all that like it's very very difficult um i mean i'm guilty of it too but like i'll, I'll have like at most five tabs open maybe six at the most. i think that is something not necessarily a question but more so a compliment or even just like uh noticing a pattern of people who are involved in a lot of things whether it's know podcasts writing i listen to a lot of uh, like the freakonomics yeah i love those last of whatever and um i think it's dubner does the people i mostly admire but just people who are involved especially you in all of these things and just being very disciplined and maximizing time i think that's something that i'm really harsh on myself for the past like three years and potentially even now of, like i could be filling time much more efficiently and, you know, obviously a lot of people are victims of that over. Yeah. It's you know, not easy, man. Like, I struggle with that shit a lot. Like, it's hard to stay focused. And there are definitely times throughout the week where I will lose focus. And the next thing I know, I just keep switching between that. Like, yeah, it happens to me, too. So it's very hard to stay disciplined. But it's like a muscle, right? The more you do it, the better you will become at it. So it starts by just having a structure in place. And then forcing yourself to be a little bit uncomfortable with the distraction and just know that, okay, eventually this is going to pass. Like I'll forget the urge to go do this thing. Like it won't even be an afterthought. Right. So just recognize that. Meditation is a big one too. Do you use yeah. a specific app? Like uh, I've used no. um, Headspace quite a bit. No, I used to, cause I mean, a lot of guided meditations are actually on Spotify for free. And okay. YouTube. So I, I used a couple on um, Spotify, but now I just do it in silence. Like if anything, I listen to like the sound of boiling water, mm -hmm. which is quite soothing because I'm waiting nice. for the coffee to get done. Yeah. So um, just a general question to everyone. Like, so um, with, you know, the, like the current situation, the pandemic and everything going on and lots of like uh, data being generated for this and that, what are you guys like looking forward to? Like, is there anything specific um, like data or insights you're looking forward to? Cause I, I personally want to look into um, the like manufacturing and um, like how much people have bought, like, uh, like, you know, temp like those uh, one-time use masks, uh, PPEs and, uh, or gloves. I see uh, gloves being like used and thrown everywhere. So that, and of course, like pollution, car pollution also. Um, but those are the kind of the things I, I'm interested in and about in the next like couple of years. Let's see the effects during this time. Yeah, I'm thinking it's going to be a big boom in local businesses and local e-commerce. I think that's going to be the next wave. Because um, people, people are just going to want to buy locally, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these stores will, the ones that you used to be able to walk into and just order shit while you're cramped as fuck in a line, like those places, they need to have a system in place so that people can just order from home online, come pick it up at a specific time and go on about their day, right? So seeing the transformation of storefronts like that move to this right. model, um, that's going to require a massive IT infrastructure and that itself is going to generate tremendous amounts of data, especially you add in like loyalty programs where you have maybe a citywide loyalty program, right? Now you can track the buying behavior of 
individual people in cities and get the right coupons and deals to them, like shit like that. It, that's super exciting. Wow. I didn't think about that. That's, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm huge on buying local. Like that's, that's right. my thing. Like I only drink local beer. Like I'll not drink beer if it was not made in the city. So those places, those breweries that I once used to go to quite frequently, um, they're shutting down, right? You can't sit down. Like this, this weekend on Monday in Manitoba, all these breweries, I think pretty much all of them have to shut down their seating space. So if I want good beer, we'll now have to go there, buy it. So, yeah. So now, like, now that you've said that, I just thought about, um, you know, Eric Weber, uh, he started working at Yelp a couple months ago. Now I'm like thinking if he, like kind of foresaw this happening or he just like you know like he's like working with like local business data and all that on uh, yelp so like we should we should message him like <laughs> make that a linkedin post ask him and then tag me in it too because i'd love to hear the answer yeah that's that's interesting you said that huh yeah. wow but obviously that's important now is like people need to be or companies organizations are really trying to be immune to circumstances like that, you know, like. Yeah. Remote it's a huge work. Hit. yeah. Yeah. I mean, even remote work, like the amount of data that's going to generate is going to be yeah. insane too. Right. So I don't think data science is like ever going anywhere. We're just only ever going to make more data at more velocity and veracity and people are going to need to check its validity. And what other, whatever other V I'm missing. Yeah, so all this empty spots will be removed from the podcast. It's just the people on YouTube that have to sit through this. <laughs> sit through the awkward silences. Um, all right, well, I'm just going to keep it going then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, you mentioned you read a lot of books for the, yeah. uh, before, when you interview the authors. Um, so like, yeah. ha, do you retain all the information? How do, how do you keep track of uh, things you read? Yeah. So my trick lately has been taking what I read and doing for, for example, like yeah, I was doing that hashtag hundred days reading on, on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. Don't use that hashtag anymore just because it's not helpful, but taking like an entire chapter of a book and distilling that down into 1300 characters to post on LinkedIn post, like that takes a tremendous amount of work, right? So you have to really go through the chapter in its entirety to pick out what the essence of it is and then present that with literally the fewest possible characters. So that forces you really to, to understand something. Um, but I'm now moving towards like just writing more longer form stuff and it's derivative off of like, let's say I read something in a book I'm now just writing a piece about it. And like the goal is to like have that be a blog post, right? Or maybe have that turn into just a solo episode on the podcast where I just read what I wrote and release that. Um, so that's some, those are some ways, yeah, that I'm using to, to retain information is just by applying it somehow. Makes sense, yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. I just finished reading uh, Maya Grossman's Invaluable. Uh, amazing book, only 150 yeah. pages. Yeah, wow. yeah. So yeah. much information. Yeah, I interviewed Maya um, a few weeks ago, so I'll be releasing that episode in the near future. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Invaluable. Great. Awesome. It's such a good book. Really enjoyed it. I'll link to that in the show notes as well so people can go check that out. Awesome. Yeah. What else have you read? How about Owen, Jaya? Yeah, yeah, go for everyone. <laughs> I feel bad. No, nah, dude, nah, it's all good. I read uh, not related to data necessarily, more so related to just current events. Malcolm Gladwell's um, Talking with Strangers. Okay, yeah. Um, one of my favorite authors, but just it was really kind of scary to how related it was to just current events specifically, you know, with injustice, police brutality, and mm -hmm. understanding people that we don't necessarily know. Yeah, I've listened I to that one on audiobook. And that was interesting, the way he put it together on audiobook. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't finish it, though. I Like, because I'll start books, and I just sometimes don't 
finish them. I got a shit ton of books on Audible because Audible now allows you to get a bunch of books for free through their premium membership thing now. I have a question now. about Audible. I was yes. considering uh, an Audible subscription because I realized that I'm becoming a book collector than a reader. It's mm. like my to read list is growing faster than I'm able to catch up with it. So I was considering Audible, but what I don't like about audiobooks is that I I like the idea of highlighting and physically underlining um, and going back to it and reviewing and rereading without actually going through the whole book becomes easier with an actual book. Even if it's on Kindle, I can still highlight it. But with audiobooks, how do you retain all that information? How do you review? Yeah, so for me, when it comes to audiobooks, like if I like the book, I'll just get the physical copy as well. So books that I like, I actually just have the physical copy and I do everything you just talked about. So notes, highlighting and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I've got a huge collection <clears throat> of books from that. Um, but sometimes what I'll also do with audiobooks is you can add notes on Audible. So you just hit the add note and just a quick reminder about what it's about. Um, but like, I don't really do that often. It's just, if I like the book, I'll, I'll just buy the physical copy. Um, because I've been hacking Audible's credit system for a very long time. So I feel bad sometimes that, that I'm stealing from these authors, but uh, they're, do that. they're getting their money back. Okay. <laughs> also, uh, Ashen and Owen, uh, just uh, tell me about yourself since I joined late. Uh, couldn't really catch up with the intro. Yeah. So, me like a absolutely um so i was i was born and raised in nepal um uh, been in the states for half my life uh but i uh, let's see undergrad i started with chemi chemi and then i switched over to it very basic like business admin actually um 2017 graduated uh worked as a contractor at the fda and then um now i've been working at 14 west this company started as a solution like a triage coordinator uh, and I just like, it's been four weeks since I started, uh, as a junior data developer. So, um, pretty excited and I uh, got into data science, uh, since the lockdown. So I'm very new to the field, but I love, uh, listening to, uh, you know, everyone's stories. And of course, uh, her pre's podcasts are amazing and just, I don't know, the community is awesome on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I just love everything about it. It's just challenging. It's everything is new and things are always changing. Um, so yeah, that's very best cool. thing. And uh, uh, so you you mentioned that you uh, work for the FDA as a contractor for like a, five uh, six months. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm curious, what did you do for them? A very basic IT, like okay. IT support. Yeah. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering if it was if it actually had to do with like the approval process or something. Yeah, we worked on like the we like process like just um don't like kind of like process their documents, the approval documents and stuff, and um you know handled that side of things, but not necessarily uh, had any say in the yeah approval at all. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome uh, to DSTJ, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've enjoyed it. And it's not data science dream job, though. It's this open <laughs> open office hours <laughs> for the podcast community. But oh. but that does remind me, though, that this yeah. weekend, if you guys are interested, you can join data science dream job at seventy percent off. It's dsdj.co forward slash artists seventy. Oh. So definitely check that out. Um, through Data Science Dream Job, you get to join me for office hours multiple times a week. So that's like, I'm, I'm doing that Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and some Saturdays. Um, so it's office hours like this, but they're a bit, bit more lively just because there's uh, more people. And, people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, I am so sorry. I thought this was... No, this, you're definitely welcome to join in. It's it's open office hours. Like Jaya, who just left, she's actually part of DSDJ as well. So, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so she's hanging out as well. Okay. okay. Yeah, definitely yeah. DSDJ students are welcome. But mm. I think they get enough of me during the week, probably. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
And uh, what about you, Owen? I'll mute myself first. Yeah, sure. Um, my formal education is in math and statistics. Uh -huh. um, really wanted to be a statistician and realized that it's not as sexy as being a data scientist. Um, I wanted to be, I wanted to work in the sports industry, realized I was not going to make any money. Um, so tried to go to something more fruitful, fruitful, ended up getting a reporting position at Kohl's, which is the largest, um, you know, corporate employer in Wisconsin, ended up just wanting to do something different. So I moved down to Nashville and I'm currently working in education for Metro Nashville public schools. There's a longitudinal study through um, the National Institute of Justice, where I'm essentially cleaning administrative data for the school district um, to go toward the larger research, which basically incorporates like neighborhood, um, like community factors, including violence and how that relates to discipline in schools. Um, the problem with that, <laughs> problem with that is I'm not doing too much with the data other than cleaning it. Um, so I'm currently moonlighting um, in a contracting position that's more data science focused. And I'm hoping for when the grant is done, I'm, I'll do something a little bit more robust as, as far as modeling. But my background and interest is definitely in programming in R and data visualization, okay. obviously statistics. Okay, well, that's very cool. Um, I used to be a st statistician back in the days. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to yeah. bring up. Um, but yes, Harpreet, go ahead. You no, it's just know. statistics is, it's fun, I guess, but it's not, I think statistics and data science get mixed up way more than they should. Like mm -hmm. you use statistics as a part of data science, but data science itself is not statistics. So it's there's such people, a broad field, yeah. Yeah, well, people get super pedantic about things on LinkedIn um, when it's it's it frustrates me sometimes I'm just gonna leave it at that let's put it at that but yeah it's it's I think statistics is about inference and maybe sometimes prediction but machine learning data science is more about prediction than it is about inference so we might employ some statistical techniques but maybe sometimes the in certain scenarios we can bend and break some of the rules of statistics to do what we're trying to do, right? Totally. And a super easy example of that is, okay, let's say you're trying to make a linear regression and you are intentionally wanting to make a biased model so that it is biased towards giving values that are higher, so larger values, right? Yeah, so you can build a biased model and violate some rules of statistics to make that happen if if what you're trying to do is you know i guess nudge some behavior to be a higher value then yeah just thinking out loud there but yeah data science is not statistics hence the title of the episode i released this week with i was just about Andy to say Bell. that uh <laughs> data science is the least important part of statistics but yeah guys so we're gonna just wrap it up so um it's almost almost the hour here. Appreciate you guys hanging out. Um, this episode is going to be posted on the podcast as an audio episode. I'll post this up on YouTube so people will check it out. And I'll be sure to link to all the awesome stuff that we're talking about here. Well, at least the ones I remember. Um, so take care, guys. Got some awesome stuff happening next week. So on Monday, I've got an episode, yes, on Monday, releasing with uh, Brendan Kumrasamy. And he is talking about how to be a better public speaker. So that's going to be a super uh, interesting episode. On Thursday, I've got a super, super special episode coming up. So special that I forgot which one it was. So I have to I have to go in to the to the hosting site. And I'll I'll let you know uh, which episode I'm releasing on Thursday. And that is, oh, yes, yes. Thursday is all about how to fight churn with data science. So Carl Gold, Dr. Carl Gold, uh, CEO of Zora, who wrote the book, um, Fighting Churn with Data. Um, he's on there, and he's talking all about uh, pretty much how to build churn models and best practices for that. So that will be really good talk. Um, so definitely check that out. 
Cool. Well, thank you guys for hanging out and I'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Yeah, thanks for hosting. See y'all. Bye.